Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started um, here. This is uh, typically what we do um, to uh, get started with NEON data is um, go to uh, the data portal page. And that's where you can find all the information um, about uh, our data products. So we have 182 different products being, um, being collected across um, 81 different field sites. Uh, so if you want to follow along, um, you can go to this uh, URL here, data.neonscience.org. I'll throw that into the chat. Um, and uh, you would go to this explore data button here. Um, and that's where you can start searching through our 180 different data products. Um, so you can put into the search any term that you're interested in. So of course, we've got not only this organismal mammal data, but also lots of abiotic variables and other things that you might be of interest for an analysis. Um, so in this case, I've typed in mammal, um, and it's going to filter down to all the data products we have that might involve mammals or rodents or whatnot. So you can see there's a few of them. And since we're going to be talking about the small mammal box trapping data today, I'm going to click on that one. Um, and so this is uh, what we call our data product landing page. And it's really helpful for orienting yourself to any NEON data product that you're interested in getting started with. So um, it starts out with just an abstract of basic details about how the data are collected. Um, it talks a little bit about the latency, so how much time you might expect um, to wait until the um, until the uh, data are available on our portal. And then, of course, if you're using our data, we ask that you do a proper citation um, in any papers and presentations. The reason for that is just to spread the word about our data and also to help us with our reporting metrics to the NSF who's funding the project. Um, and then, of course, uh, a little bit on documentation. And so uh, this is super helpful if you're trying to dig in for the first time and you want to know a little bit about how the data are collected. I usually recommend the user guide. That's kind of a 10 to 15 page document that tells you um, the basics of the protocol without getting into every single possible detail. Um, uh, so that's good for if you have like a basic question about methodology. Um, the quick start guides are wonderful when you just want to get started, right? You kind of you already kind of know what we're doing um, and you want to download the data. Um, the quick start, this is, a, is an example here of the quick start guide. Um, it'll give you just the very basics about how the data are collected. And then it's this table joining section down here that I think a lot of people find quite useful. It tells you a lot of times NEON data end up being collected into multiple different tables that you then have to join together to get information about, for instance, the effort that was done for the sampling itself uh, in combination with like what the trap collection data say, and then the trap collection results on each of the individual you know, measurements and taxon IDs and things like that to link that up with the pathogen um, results from the samples that were um, analyzed. You know, All those things often require joining tables and that'll probably become more clear as we talk through the um, the uh, uh, the tutorial that we're going to do today. So um, that's a little bit on the documentation. There is an issue log. So anytime protocols can't be followed exactly or something comes up that interrupts sampling, things like that, uh, we have an issue start and end date, um, and it all goes in here. And so if you're looking for something specific that doesn't look quite the way you would expect it to, you can come to this issue log and see if there's an entry there. Um, and then last but not least on these data product details pages uh, is the data availability and download information. Uh, so you can see all the different sites um, down here as rows and the years as columns and the blue squares indicate when there's data available for that particular um, spot. So um, one way to download data, of course, and I, I apologize, I'm not sure if you can see my full screen, but there's a download data button here in the blue. Um, so that was my quick intro. Um, and uh, next, before we launch into the R um, portion of the uh, tutorial webinar, I did want to just talk real quickly about how we collect the mammal data just to help everyone orient to what we're actually looking at when we're looking at the data. Um, so we have 44 neon terrestrial sites where we're collecting mammal data. And uh, there's on average six mammal grids at each of those sites. Um, there are always going to be three pathogen grids at every site, and those are the ones that get sampled um, three nights, roughly in a row, you know, sequentially, um, per bout. Uh, and then there's anywhere from zero to five what we call diversity grids, 
And that's one night of trapping per bout. And those tend to be at the land cover classes that are less dominant at the site, but they kind of help us maybe capture taxa that we wouldn't see um, in the dominant land cover class. So that's kind of why those are in there. Um, the trapping consists, each grid is going to have 100 Sherman traps. Um, they're at 10 meter spacing and they're in a 10 by 10 grid. And then in terms of the bouts per year, um, for those of you that are familiar with NEON, we're sort of separated into eco-climatic domains. There's 20 of those. And each one of those 20 has a core site. Uh, and so at those core sites, we're doing six bouts per year. So uh, separated roughly by about a month and, and sort of over the growing season is when those tend to occur. And then there's um, uh, anywhere from one to several gradient sites at each of those eco-climatic domains. And those are sites where we only do four bouts per year, but still quite a bit of data at those as well. So that's what we're looking at um, for mammal data. Um, so I am going to pop over uh, to Safari again and show you, uh, if you registered for this ahead of time, you're going to see um, in the email a link to this tutorial. I'm going to try to throw it in the chat as well. I'd like everybody now to go ahead and get our studio open um, on their computer. So hopefully you got the email that kind of indicates which packages you should install and things like that. Um, I'm going to clear my working environment. You certainly don't have to do that. Um, if you've got things in there that you don't want to lose, maybe took a long time to process, um, but I'm going to remove all my objects. Uh, and then I do again have that um, tutorial link here at the top of this page. And the first thing that we're going to do um, is start by loading the packages. So hopefully you've all already installed them. If you haven't, you would use the install packages function there. Um, but since I already have them, I'm just going to type in library to call them up and let um, my computer know that I need to use them. So um, dplyr is one package. Uh, let's see here. Neon Utilities is another fantastic package that helps with downloading um, the data. The Neon OS package is wonderful for um, kind of spot checking to make sure the data looks the way we want them to. And then ggplot for um, plotting out the data. So go ahead and get those loaded up. And then the next thing we're gonna do is kind of step one, which is uh, the most fun step, I think, which is getting all that data onto your computer. So we've got a huge wealth of resources there. And it's as simple as just using um, the function in Neon Utilities load by product. Um, and uh, the way this works is uh, the first thing you're going to do is put in the DP ID. That's the data product ID. That's going to be found, like I showed you, um, on the um, on the data product landing page is one spot uh, and then various other places throughout um, the website. So uh, that would be where you would go to locate that. In the case of small mammal data, it's this DP1.10072.001. Um, and then I just selected three sites that I knew had some fun um, data to look at. Uh, so SCBI is gonna be in Maryland, um, Kanza is in Kansas, and then UNDERC is in Wisconsin. Uh, and then um, we're going to just do the basic package. Um, Expanded has some extra data things that we're not going to be using today. Um, we don't need to check the sides because I've already um, made sure that it's not going to take forever to download. But if you didn't know how big it was, you might want to include that um, so that you don't end up spending, you know, timing out on the download and stuff like that. Um, so I am using as a start date January of 2021 and as an end date, uh, January of, or sorry, December of 2022. So we're gonna have um, two years of data here uh, and we can go ahead and run that. Uh, and you can see that the computer's uh, finding those files and, and downloading them um, relatively efficiently, which is very nice. Um, so in my opinion, this is an easier way to download the data because it just uh, is all already in the R environment that you need it in for working with the data. Uh, so, um, so great. So that didn't take too long. It's already downloaded. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of show you what comes up here. So you can see that it ends up as a list, um, with seven, uh, objects inside of it. And so we can kind of take a look at what those things are. And I just think it, this, it's the same for all the different data products. So I do find it useful to kind of 
take a peek at what um, what you get in that list. Um, so the first thing is categorical codes, and then this number here corresponds to the data product ID right here. Um, and the categorical categorical codes file is just the controlled lists that are used when we collect the data. So we use this nice little app that lets us have drop down menus so we can constrain the values. And so that's the constrained values. Um, there, uh, the issue log is going to be what you would find on the website on that data product um, details day page. And then, as I mentioned, they get the data often gets split up into different table tables. So the MAM per plot night table is going to be all the information about the mammal trapping effort. So when about was completed, um, what the dates were and times and things like that, uh, as well as an event ID that kind of groups that bout as one. Um, so the next thing that we kind of want to do is just take a look at um, you know, duplicates and make sure that we don't have duplicate records. Um, and so uh, our that NEON OS package that we downloaded earlier and, um, and started to use has a fantastic duplicate checking function built in for all of the different um, NEON data products. Uh, and so um, we can we can take advantage of that for mammals uh, and and double check to see if there are any duplicates in the data that we just downloaded. Um, okay, so we're gonna set it the data. Uh, we're gonna check both uh, of the data tables that uh, we downloaded. So the man per plot night is the one we'll start with. Um, you have to tell it what the variables file is that got downloaded when we downloaded the data. Um, and then you have to tell it what table we're looking at. Okay. Um, oops, that's not. Okay, so man, but I know dupes. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and run that. And uh, lucky us, there's no duplicated key values found. Uh, if there is, you would want to kind of go in and see. Um, if they're if they're true duplicates and kind of get rid of the extra records and of course an extra step would be to let this neon science staff know you know if you find something like that so that we can um, fix it for everybody um, and then we're also constantly monitoring them um, and fixing that kind of thing uh, on a rolling basis as well so um, we do our best not to have that happen but every now and then it does um, if we haven't had a chance to uh, quality check it before you've downloaded it. Uh, so, uh, the next thing we want to do is for the MAM, uh, per trap night table, this one's a little trickier, uh, because, um, every now and then, and this is sort of unique to mammals, we'll end up getting, a um, trap that has, um, two individuals in it, uh, that aren't tagged individually, and so they would look like a duplicate, but they're not, um, so, uh, this little code chunk that I'm putting in here is just checking to see if there's uh, any untagged uh, multiple individuals in a trap um, in this data set. Uh, and you can see this is what we just um, created and it's a it's a data frame with zero entries. So we don't need to worry about that particular issue for checking duplicates in the tra per trap night table. So now we're just going to do um, the same uh, removal of duplicates or checking for duplicates in MAM per trap night since we don't have to worry about the fact that there could have been multiple individuals in a trap. Um, so we go back and use that remove dupes function again. This time we are going to do the MAM per trap night table. Um, and We hopefully should see. No, oh, we did something wrong. Forgot a comma. All right. All right. So again, no duplicates, which is wonderful. So um, we're just kind of going through the error checking duplicate. You know, this is sort of best practices again. Um, so we haven't quite gotten into the analyses yet, but we're the, the data set so far is looking pretty good. Uh, the next thing we want to do, like I said, uh, there's a lot of times a situation where we have all of the event ID information in the per plot night sort of trapping effort table. And what we want to do is join that with the um, per trap night data table that has all the collection information in it so that we can have both those things together. Because when we do 
um, the analysis of the minimum number known alive, um, we're going to need both those pieces of information uh, to complete that. Uh, so the next step in this particular uh, process is going to be to create a, a data frame that I'm going to call MAM join. So that's going to be the joined table. Uh, and again, this is using that NEON OS package um, that has this handy function join table NEON. Um, and it's going to let us um, join the perplotnite table uh, with the protratnite table. And I'm going to use the duplicate free. Um, uh, versions. Uh, so hypothetically, if there had been duplicates, these would be the ones that didn't have any duplicates in them. And so I'm using those. You could just use the straight up data since there were no um, duplicates, but we're being sort of purist here. Uh, per okay. So let's see. All right. So now we have this lovely joined uh, data frame that has um, all this, all the same variables that were in the perplotnite table linked up with all the ones in the per, per uh, trapnite table. So uh, that's wonderful. And the next thing we want to do is um, uh, double check that the tag IDs um, that that should uh, indicate a capture, uh, really do indicate a capture, um, and uh, and that the ones that um, where there were no captures don't have any tag IDs. Uh, and so the way we're going to do this is just uh, trap status error check. So this is just another uh, kind of best practice to make sure that the um, trap statuses are accurate in the data. Um, per trap. Right. So again, we're using those no duplicate files, um, and we're going to filter out uh, any um, where the tag ID is not blank, right? So there is a tag ID in this particular uh, filtered data set. Uh, and if there is a tag ID, then we want uh, to find the word capture in the trap status, okay? So the so the two trap statuses with a capture would be um, a trap status of five, which is a straight up capture, or a trap status of four, which means multiple captures in the trap. And so both of those have the word capture in them. Um, and so that's what we're searching for here. Um, and uh, if, um, again, we're finding that there are no situations where, um, there is a tag ID, but the trap status is not set to one of the capture trap statuses. Okay, so that so that's again just another um, error check saying, you know, the data are looking the way we expect them to. Um, you can do the converse, right, um, to make sure uh, that um, you know if if there isn't a tag ID that it's not labeled as a capture, right? Because we don't want to miss those. So we're just literally doing the opposite of what we just did. Um, and we're going to look now for, oops, I want to capitalize that. OK, great. OK, so and again, this should be empty. So it is so wonderful. Um, all right, so the next thing we want to do is filter down to just the um, target uh, individuals. So when we do this trapping, of course, it's nocturnal. We're setting them out in the evening and we are going back to collect them in the morning. And of course, every now and then um, we'll get a stray squirrel or some other diurnal um, species uh, that shows up in the trap. Um, but, you know, those, since they're not what we're targeting, uh, oftentimes there's going to be, you know, those data are less reliable, I would say, than what we would consider our target species. So for the purposes of this particular tutorial, um, and just in general, uh, since most people are going to want to filter those out, I wanted to show you all how um, to go about doing that. Um, and so the first thing we were going to do is download um, a taxonomy list. So any NEON data product that has taxonomic identification is going to have an associated taxon ID list that has all the information about um, the various taxa in that product. Um, so in the case of the mammals, um, this is what we just downloaded. 
we have a four letter taxon ID code um, that's associated with a scientific name. And then um, lots and lots of additional information. But the thing that we're going to be focused in on here is this taxon protocol category. Um, so some things we consider opportunistic, uh, shrews and things like that. Um, you know, we get them and we keep track of them, uh, but we do less uh, analyses on those than we would on our target species um, that are these nocturnal uh, rodents. And so um, we are going to use that to filter. Um, filter our data set uh, to only the target species so that we're um, only looking at those. So I'm going to create a data frame that um, that is uh, taking that taxon ID list, this mam.list, uh, and it's going to filter um, that to uh, the taxon protocol category the of target. Uh, so that is what we're looking at there. And um, and scientific name. All right. So uh, wonderful. So. Now we have filtered um, that uh, is basically just the target. That's just a list of all of our target taxa. Uh, and then the other thing that's sometimes nice to do, so, you know, when we looked at the data set for the per trap night table, there's quite a bit um, of columns in there, which is wonderful. You know, there's anything that you could potentially need, but we're going to filter it down to just the columns that we're looking at. And it just makes it easier to um, kind of look at uh, look at the data frame itself and um, Oops. Um, and know what we're looking at, especially if there's something that we're um, wanting to dig into a little bit more. So that uh, is basically just defining the core fields that we're going to be interested in for this analysis, uh, that being the plot that the data were collected from, the collect date, uh, that event ID, which as I mentioned is sort of the bout identification value, uh, a tag ID for each individual, and then a taxon ID, which is gonna tell us the species. So those are really the only things that we're looking at um, for the analysis that we're doing today. Um, and, oh, we've already required dplyr earlier, so we don't need to do that step. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is just filter down um, that joined data set. Um, so that mam.join, which we created up here, um, which was a joining of the perplat night and the pertrap night tables. Um, I am going to filter that down to only the ones that are captured and only the ones that are target taxa um, and, and just keep only the core fields that we just identified. And that's going to be kind of our data set that we're going to work with um, for the rest of uh, the meeting. So, um, so I'm going to call that file uh, or that data frame captures. And we're going to um, use that mam join data frame. We're going to filter it down. Uh, again, looking for that word capture uh, in the trap status, because again, there's two trap statuses that indicate that something was captured, um, either one capture in the trap or two captures in the trap. And so this is just a simple way of getting both of those without having to kind of um, specifically uh, write both of them out. Um, and then we want to uh, do the taxon ID. Um, and we need that to match that target taxa, taxon ID. So again, target taxa is what we created here, where we filtered down to just the target taxa, um, those nocturnal rodents. And then we're going to select out the core fields columns that we just created up here so that we're not looking at 500 columns. Uh, and then uh, just for, um, you know, appearances sake, we're going to change the collect date. Um, the collect date, because of it was in both of the tables that we joined together, had a collect date dot X, uh, and that bothered me. So I just changed the name um, to collect date. So I'm going to just show you what that data frame looks like. This is kind of what we're going to be working with um, for most of the rest of the tutorial 
here. Um, so we've got a night uh, UID, which is, um, you know, just kind of an individual uh, night of sampling. Um, it's unique for each individual night of sampling. Uh, there's a plot ID, a collect date. This is going to be the tag ID for each individual that was captured. Uh, the taxon ID, that four letter code. Um, you can uh, transpose those into the actual names if you look at the taxon um, table that we downloaded earlier. And then um, the event ID, which is again, uh, marking a single bout um, together. So the next thing we want to do is uh, calculate the minimum number known alive. Uh, and this is just kind of an index of abundance. And the main assumption here is that uh, let's say we trap for five uh, nights. And on night one, we capture an individual with a given tag ID. And on night four, we capture an individual with a given tag ID, but we didn't capture nights two and three. Um, we're sort of assuming that it was there nights two and three and it just didn't happen to go into a trap. Um, and so that's the that's really the basic assumption that we're doing here. Uh, and so in order to work with that um, uh, assumption, we wanna make that as assumption in our data explicit instead of implicit, right? And so um, the only thing that this next section of code is doing is um, taking those uh, extra nights of sampling that don't actually show up as a row in our data frame and adding them in. Um, and so that's uh, how we're going to calculate the number of individuals on any given night because we're just we're, then we just have that data frame and we can calculate the numbers because we've made that assumption that they're there. Um, so that is what uh, we're doing. And so um, because again, this is one of those kind of convoluted for loops uh, that I was mentioning that we're going to be working with. So I'm gonna uh, take a second and pop over to the NEON tutorial. Um, you can see that we've already uh, done quite a few of these sections here. Um, so I'm gonna scroll down to the section that we're at. Um, so we've already checked for duplicates, joined the tables, checked for problems with the tag IDs, and now we're at this minimum number known alive um, section. Uh, so I'm gonna just grab everything in the black box. So we are, um, just to kind of help folks orient. Uh, we are in section three, calculating minimum number known alive. We've jumped down um, past the first box where we were filtering out the target taxa. And we are in the second box. And I'm just gonna copy and paste um, the code from this black code chunk um, into um, my uh, R studio session here. Um, and then I am going to uh, run those lines and then I'll talk through what it's doing because it's going to take, last time I was a little surprised it took um, a few minutes to run. It used to be faster. I don't know why my computer must be overwhelmed. Um, so basically what we're doing is creating, um, you know, all of the unique uh, tags um, that are present in our data set. So that's what this distinct is doing. So this is every unique tag. Um, that's present in the in the captures data set that we're uh, that we just created, um, and then we want to create an empty data frame that we're going to populate. Um, and as I mentioned, the goal here ultimately, like this captures data set has two thousand three hundred eighty five rows. Ultimately, this caps new data set is going to have extra rows that are just filling in those implicit presences for those individuals. Um, that uh, are not actually in our data because we didn't actually observe them, but we're pretending like we did because that's the assumption we're making for the um, abundance in index that we're doing. Um, so this for loop, all we're doing is just looping through each individual unique tag. So that's what we created here. Um, and we're creating um, this individual, which is basically a, a, you know, from the captured data set, anything that had that tag ID. So any record. So there could be one record if we only caught it once. There could be 10 records if we caught it 10 times. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at for this individual um, or indiv uh, field here. And then all we want to do is identify the first date that it was captured uh, and the last date that it was captured, right? And so we're taking the minimum of that collect date and the maximum of that collect date. It could be the same day, right? If it's only captured once, or it could be um, dates that are months apart, right? And so that's that's what we're doing here. Um, for possible dates, we're creating a sequence of every possible day in between the first capture and the last capture um, where it could have been captured. Um, but of course, we didn't sample every single one of those uh, nights because we're not sampling every night. We're just sampling during our bouts. Uh, so we take this possible dates, which is a sequence from the first capture to the last capture of every single day, and then filtering it down to the days that we were actually out sampling, right? Um, so we may or may not have caught that individual, but we're still filtering it down to the ones where we were out trapping and that individual may or may not have been present. 
Um, so this next section is just filtering um, down to the to the list of dates when we were out collecting um, and then fill, filling in um, the values for that individual tag ID. Um, and then uh, the all nights is where we are, um, you know, joining these potential night values with the individual collection data for that unique tag number. Um, so now we have, you know, a mini data set for this one particular individual tag ID uh, where the, there's a first capture date, a last capture date, and then all the other sampling dates in between uh, that are filled in with all the appropriate data. Um, so now we've done that for one unique tag and we're going to, uh, you know, loop through, uh, uh, we're going to R-bind um, those things together, right, with all the other things we've looped through so that eventually we end up with um, each uh, unique tag has that full data set. Um, so I think it should be uh, finishing up here pretty soon, but uh, certainly opportunities for um, folks to enter into the chat if they're uh, not sure how things are working or struggling to keep up or have a question um, while we wait for that to run. So the next thing that we want to do is we can take uh, this um, data set and see if uh, there were any untagged um, individuals and, and add them back in, but I don't think there are. So that's kind of what we're doing there. Yeah, so there's no untagged ones. So we're, so we're good to go um, on that front. Uh, and then the next thing that we wanna do is um, start calculating uh, the, the minimum number known alive. And so um, I think, again, it's just gonna be easier to pop over to the tutorial, especially since we only have 15 minutes left. And, um, and grab that code chunk again. So now we're just scrolling back down um, to the next code chunk where we've created a function that's going to calculate the minimum number node alive. And we're basically just kind of summarizing the total numbers that we see um, in this new data set, this new data frame that we created um, of the number of individuals um, grouped by event ID and then plot ID. Um, so a plot ID is like a mammal grid, basically. You can think of it that way. Um, so I have copied that section of the code. I'm going to run that. Uh, and this is just a function um, where uh, we're giving it a capture data frame. So that's going to be this caps new data frame that we created that has all those implicit abundances made explicit. Uh, and all it's doing is just summarizing the number of distinct individuals at each uh, event ID. So within each bout that were captured. Um, so it's literally just the number of individuals um, at this particular site um, at the bout uh, that we're that we're looking at. So that's all that's all that function is doing. Um, and uh, then if we wanted to calculate uh, the the average across um, a site, so so if you recall, we have anywhere from three to eight. Um, grids, so like uh, like sampling grids in a site. Uh, so we're this function allows us to calculate at the grid level, um, or it will give us at the site level um, by summarizing using an average, right? So in this particular case, it's just the the it, the number at that particular plot, and then if we want to take across all the plots and summarize with the average, we can do that as well with that function. So that's um, what's happening there. Um, and so what I'm going to do is feed that function. I'm going to create a new object called MNKA, and I'm going to feed the function that cool data frame um, that we made uh, and just take a peek um, at what we see there, um, which is just the mean uh, number of individuals uh, on this event ID, right? So at Kanza, this particular site in Kansas in 2021, and then 27 is just the week of the sampling date, right? So that's how many we saw um, there. Um, so that's uh, a basic abundance thing, but we might be more interested in looking at uh, perhaps a particular species, um, you know, and looking at just the minimum number of that particular species. And so we can do that as well. And again, I'm going to just pop over to this tutorial and grab um, the code chunk um, from the next black coding box and paste it in here. And so what we're, uh, what I thought would be interesting to look at is um, Paramiscus leucopus. So that's an, uh, a taxon that's found at each of these 
um, plot at, at each of these sites that we're looking at. Uh, and it's going to be there every year and vary in abundance. And I thought it might be fun to kind of take a peek at what that uh, figure would look like um, looking at the abundance for that species. Um, so th the way I do that uh, to calculate the minimum number of known alive by species uh, is just to to generate um, a unique species list. So this is all the individual species that are found in our data set. Um, so you can see there's what, 15, 16, 17 different species, right? And we're gonna loop through each one of those and just run that minimum number known alive um, function uh, by site, right? Um, using that particular uh, subset of the taxonomic data, right? So, uh, so this species list is each individual species we're going to take, you know, species I and filter it down to that taxon and then just calculate the minimum number known alive for that particular um, taxon. So that's kind of what we're doing there. Uh, and I'm going to run that for loop. Oh, I didn't run all of it. Sorry. Um, great. So that'll take a second. And then um, if we wanted to look at an abundance figure, of just that paramiscus leucopus. So this MNKA by species is gonna have the minimum number of known alive um, by species and site, uh, right? And so we're gonna just filter that particular data frame down to just the ones with the paramiscus leucopus. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. Um, and then uh, in order to plot it, we need to end up with a data frame that has the dates uh, of the sampling events. Um, so ultimately what I wanted to look at was uh, the, the abundance of this paramiscus leucopus across time. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to get the collect dates um, uh, at which we were sampling so that we have um, the x-axis to plot there. So that's what this um, date DF data frame is doing. Um, it's just generating um, the collect dates for each event ID. Uh, so again, uh, an event ID is going to be a bout of sampling. So at those pathogen grids, there's going to be three different nights, and we just want the minimum collect dates so that we're distilling it down to a single night, um, because uh, otherwise um, we would have three dates for a single event ID, and we just want one. Um, so the date data frame is really just uh, a list of um, event IDs and dates. Um, so then we are gonna join those dates with the minimum number known alive for the paramiscus. So I'm gonna just show you what that looks like uh, there. We have an event ID, we have a date. Um, these are only for paramiscus leucopus and we have the average uh, minimum number known alive for that particular taxon. Uh, and then we can go ahead and plot that uh, and take a look at what uh, the variation in abundance looks like from year to year and across different um, sites for that particular taxon. So this is kind of a, this is sort of the fun part is taking a peek at that figure. Um, so that's what we end up getting. So the dates are here on the x-axis and the mean minimum number known alive uh, for paramiscus leucopus at the three different sites is here. Um, and you can see, oh dear, um, there's 2021 in the kind of orange color and 2022 in the blue color. And it seems like across most of the sites, 2022 seemed to have um, a higher general abundance of this taxa than um, in 2021. Uh, and just kind of an interesting way to kind of take a huge amount of data and distill it down into an abundance metric for one particular taxon that you can compare across all these different sites. So that's one of the really neat things about NEON data is being able to um, look at cross comparisons across uh, major uh, spatial and temporal scales. Um, so, that is uh, is that section just kind of uh, looking at the abundance. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to pop in. Otherwise, I'll just keep um, keep trucking along. All right. Uh, so next, I'm going to just keep scrolling down, uh, and I'm going to go to. Um, looking at uh, the maximum abundance at these sites of all the different taxa. Um, and my reasoning for doing this was just to kind of get a sense of what the diversity might look like. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, at a site. Um, so I'm creating a new um, data frame here called TaxDat, uh, where I'm now grouping um, by the taxon ID and the site ID. Uh, and picking the maximum of this mean minimum number known alive. Um, so that 
is that uh, data frame. Uh, and again, this is just uh, a given taxon ID uh, at a given site in the maximum number we ever observed over all the two year time span of the data that we've downloaded. Um, and so that's just an, you know just another thing you can plot to kind of take a peek um, and compare across sites. And so uh, that is going to be here. And uh, again, in ggplot, we're just kind of putting in uh, the x axis is the taxon ID and the y axis is the maximum um, abundance uh, metric that we're using. Um, and then uh, this facet wrap is just uh, making it create three separate plots for the three different uh, site IDs. Um, so that's uh, that plot. Um, and so you can kind of take a look at the, uh, compare the diversity across the different sites. It's relatively similar. Um, Maryland looks like, like it maybe has slightly less uh, diversity and probably is more dominated by these two particular species than those other two sites. Um, for those folks of you who are interested in disease ecology, a lot of times kind of the diversity of small mammals at a site can be linked with some of these tick-borne pathogens in really unique and interesting ways. And so that was kind of one of the things that we were doing here with this tutorial was to kind of take a peek at some of the diversity uh, metrics and, and look at that um, in relation to the pathogen data. So uh, that is what I had for visualizing um, abundance metrics for the small mammal trapping data. And next up is uh, taking a peek at the pathogen data. Um, and I uh, see we, you know, um, I, we might go a little past one o'clock uh, in terms of the actual coding part, but I should still be able to leave some time for questions at the end, but feel free again to, to let us know in the chat if you're struggling to keep up or have questions um, about that. But again, uh, to save time, I am gonna just keep scrolling down in the tutorial uh, and grabbing these code chunks and running them um, separately uh, since we are running low on time now. Uh, this was kind of a, a meaty tutorial, I guess, in terms of content. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, the next thing we wanna do is just go back to that process of downloading data. So the rodent pathogen data are a separate data product from the small mammal trapping data. Um, so again, we go back to this cool load by product feature uh, and set in that data product ID instead of that uh, 10072, which is for the um, mammal trapping data, this one is 10064. Um, and interestingly, almost all of these, uh, or I, I suppose for observational sciences, a lot of times they end in a .001, um, but this is actually the second iteration of this product because we used to do pathogen data on hantaviruses up until 2020, and then we switched over to tick-borne disease to better match with the tick vector data that we're collecting. Um, and so that, uh, that's why that's a .002. It's the second um, iteration of this particular data product where we're looking at tick-borne pathogens instead of um, the hantaviruses. Um, again, we're just going to use the same sites, uh, looking at basic data, um, and that looks like it's already um, downloaded. So if we did that names thing, we're going to end up with the same uh, contents for this RPT dat. Again, it's a list of a bunch of items. Um, and so we're, we want to transfer the, that list of items into our environment uh, as data frames so that we can access them um, more readily. Uh, so that's what this list to environment uh, code does. Um, again, we're going to do the same uh, best practices of removing duplicates and things like that. Uh, so we'll uh, run another remove dupes function uh, for this new data set, uh, and there's no duplicated value, so that's wonderful. Um, and we can just proceed uh, with the data. Um, so the next um, section of this is um, uh, I will show you basically what um, the the rodent pathogen results uh, look like here. Uh, and basically you've got, you know, your site, your domain, um, the plot, uh, the sample ID. So this is gonna be the, this is the tag ID of the individual from which the sample came. And then here this dot B is for a blood sample and the dot E is for an ear sample. So without going into too much gory detail, the ears uh, are better targeted for um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Lyme disease. Uh, and then a lot of these other pathogens are better targeted from the blood. And so that's why we send both um, for pathogen testing uh, and we differentiate them with the dot B or the dot E. And so that's gonna become important later when I'm going through the code. Uh, and then, um, you know, these are the pathogens that we're testing for and the test result here. 
in this column. Um, and so what you'll notice is conspicuously missing is any kind of taxonomic information about the individuals from which the samples came. And the reason for that is because that's all in the mammal protrapnite table. Uh, and so again, we have to do that table joining. Um, in the particular case of mammals, uh, or, or of, the, of the mammal pathogen data, um, unfortunately, the sample IDs, because they come from ear samples and blood samples, and those are in two different columns in the mammal trapping data, um, that lovely join table neon function that works for so, so many of our data products doesn't work here. And so that's another reason we thought this tutorial would be helpful for folks um, to be able to combine uh, the mammal trapping data with the rodent pathogen data um, by using these code chunks here. So um, I'm, again, just going to copy this uh, code chunk um, to get those data joined together. Um, so unfortunately, we can't use the join table neon. So we are going to um, separate out into blood and ear samples and then join them separately and then bind them back together. Sorry, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. So um, great. All right. Uh, oh, great. Thanks, Bridget, for sending out the survey. Wonderful. Um, OK. Uh, so um, we are taking, again, the deduplicated uh, data right, that we created here. Uh, we're selecting out those column names that we think are the most uh, useful for this particular analysis. So the plot ID, collect date, sample ID, the test pathogen name, and the test result, um, and then creating a variable for site. Uh, and uh, then we are going to do the same thing with the mammal uh, per trap night data. So again, it's that deduplicated data. And we're just selecting out the most important columns that we need when we're joining the data. And again, all we're doing with the selection of columns is just reducing the data set to something that's more manageable and has only the columns we need for our analysis. So in this case, we really, we only want to know the species that the animal came from. And then, like I mentioned, there's two different columns for the blood sample ID or the ear sample ID. Um, so we need both of those if we're going to join these two together. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is uh, split up the rodent pathogen data um, into the different sample types. Um, and so uh, the way we do that is we take um, this uh, rodent pathogen data frame and filter it out. Uh, as I showed you, that sample ID is going to end in a .e if it's an ear sample. So I've created a data frame for just the rodent pathogen ear data. Um, so I'm going to run that. Oops, I didn't run this up here. Maybe I didn't run a whole bunch. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting getting ahead of myself. Um, man trap. Oh, it should be there. Um, sorry. Oops. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out why this isn't. Did I remove the... Oh, I guess I forgot to add. <laughs> Sorry. So maybe that's the... Okay, yeah. So um, it appears that when I was typing in and not... Uh, copying directly from the tutorial, I forgot uh, an underscore. And so then when I started copying in from the tutorial, instead of typing in directly, uh, that underscore uh, was creating a problem. So, um, but yeah, this is basically just the, a selected out smaller number of columns from the mammal per trap night deduplicated um, data set. So that's what we're dealing with there. Uh, and then we're gonna um, run those two um, codes and and now we've basically got the rodent pathogen data split into the ones that have sample IDs for ears and the ones that have sample IDs for blood. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna create a dot J um, data frame for each of those where we're left joining the ear data frame with the mammal trapping data um, by that ear sample ID column in the mammal trapping data. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the blood uh, sample ID. So. I'm going to run both of those and then uh, to bind them all back together, right? Because now we have, um, you know, the taxon ID now added to the rodent pathogen ear data in this data frame and the taxon ID bound to uh, the rodent pathogen blood data in this data frame. Uh, so now we just want to R bind those together. So we're just joining those two data sets um, when we run that. 
Um, and then the last column, the names didn't match. So that's why this, we have this minus eight. Uh, it's the getting rid of that eighth column there. Okay, so that gives us um, a lovely data set that now has taxon ID, right? So all that uh, convoluted um, data um, management was basically just so that we can get this taxon ID column here so that we can start looking at some of the pathogen data um, across the different taxa. Um, and uh, and check that out. So um, again, popping back over to the tutorial, uh, and I'm gonna um, copy uh, these so that we can um, take a look at uh, the pathogen prevalences uh, of the different pathogens um, across the different sites. Um, so just copying in the next uh, code chunk here. Uh, and uh, a lot of times when you're looking at pathogen data, prevalence is kind of the um, thing. So that's the percent of uh, positive infections um, in, in the particular groups that you're looking at. Um, and so that's a super common uh, metric that you would want to calculate for uh, these disease data. And so that I'm going to show you how to do that here. Um, we're taking that rodent pathogen data set that we just created, and we're grouping it across sites, uh, and then the different pathogens that we looked at in the different taxa of the individual mammals from which the samples came. And we are summarizing, uh, so we're creating summary columns where we have the total tested, which of course is going to be the denominator, uh, and the total positive, which is of course going to be the numerator. And then we are creating with this mutate uh, function, the prevalence column, which is going to be the total positive divided by the total tested. So this is going to give us a nice little prevalence um, data frame here uh, for a given site, for a given test pathogen, for a given taxa, um, right? And so you can scroll down through that and look at all the different small mammals that were tested from all the different sites in our data set and the prevalence of um, the pathogens there. And then, of course, uh, data frames are nice, but uh, graphs are even nicer. And so we're going to um, plot out uh, this, uh, looking at this prevalence data frame, uh, where the x-axis is going to be the pathogen that we tested for, and the y-axis is going to be um, prevalence. Uh, and then we're going to uh, separate out by the different sites. Okay, so this is this first particular plot is just looking across the different sites at the prevalence, um, grouping all of the, treating all the different mammal taxa that we tested. Um, samples from as sort of one big group, um, but we can also split it out by taxa if we're interested in that. So I'll show you that will be the last thing that we talk about today. Um, but you can kind of take a peek. These are the different um, pathogens we're testing for. Uh, it looks like SCBI, which is that site in Maryland, kind of has the highest diversity of pathogens. Um, Anaplasma phagocytophyllum has the highest prevalence. Um, wow, it's over 60% of the mammal um, samples that we tested, tested positive for that pathogen. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato is the pathogen causing Lyme. Um, about nearly 20% of the rodents at that site are positive for that. Uh, and then again, there's this Borrelia miyamotoi at that site. So um, given that SCBI is kind of an interesting looking site, I thought we could drill down a little bit more detail and look at the prevalence within each of the different mammal taxa that we tested samples from um, at that site. So that's the last bit of this tutorial. Uh, so we're gonna scroll down, pop this in here. Um, and sorry, I keep, um, all right. So uh, we're gonna take the prevalence uh, data set and filter it down to just that one site that we're interested in and now make a plot where um, we're wrapping instead of, uh, creating different panels for the different sites. We're creating different panels for the different um, taxa of mammals that we looked at. So I'm gonna zoom in there. Um, and uh, so you can see that we've got two different uh, taxonomic identities here. Um, and it looks like most of the diversity of pathogens is coming from this Paramiscus leucopus. And then a lot of that anaplasma is coming from this other species here. So, um, so yeah, that is that's kind of the the nitty gritty of uh, of working with the data. Um, hopefully, the sort of take homes from this are going to be um, some of the code for downloading the data directly into your thing and understanding where the documentation comes from. And as I sort of mentioned, the the sort of take homes from this particular analysis are just this um, idea that uh, the the diversity of hosts at a site might be sort of linked with the pathogen prevalence. 
um, that we see at that site. And so this was just kind of a way of looking at both of those things uh, in one. And of course, there's lots and lots of other abiotic and biotic variables that can mediate that interaction. So of course, I'm not going to make any major conclusions about <laughs> diversity in, in pathogens from this uh, exercise, but um, just kind of an interesting um, you know, subset of the data to take a peek at. So with that, we're just a little bit over, but I would love to take questions, um, answer, you know, any, anything folks might want to ask about.